Professor Wallace, what's today's date? Uh, this is the 10th of uh, uh, April, 1989. What type of, what sort of a day? Uh, it's a nice, bright, uh, sunny day, nippy. Nippy? Uh, about 50 degrees. Uh, I begin, <clears throat> and I, I also lead the interview with the question of uh, you were here. You, why did you choose the University of Pennsylvania? Why did you come to the University of Pennsylvania? Well, that can be a long story, but um, <clears throat> really for, um, uh, partly on account of uh, uh, an interest that I shared with my father, who was a historian uh, in the colonial history of Pennsylvania and particularly American Indians. Uh, and uh, as I, uh, I was in the service and my interest in uh, anthropology really began as reading that I did while I was in the service. Um, uh, after I got out, uh, I told my dad Gee, I think I'd like to go into anthropology. I know I've started out in history, but uh, where can I go to a good uh, institution for, for anthropology and particularly American Indian Studies? And he consulted a, an English professor named Cornelius Wigand, who uh, I don't think you were going to be able to interview, but who was a distinguished member of the department years ago, a folklorist and one of the people who started up the, really the English and folklore program. He was a friend of Frank Speck, so he said, well, the best place to go is the University of Pennsylvania. You can study with Frank Speck, who knows all about the American Indian. Uh, so that steered me towards uh, uh, the University of Pennsylvania, and um, there were advantages in being in Philadelphia. And so basically, I came here to, uh, to uh, study anthropology with Speck. But since I'd um, majored in history, uh, at Lebanon Valley College, where my father taught, um, I uh, continued that major uh, for the last two years of my undergraduate work and took some courses in anthropology and other things at the same time. <clears throat> so I stayed here for two years, really, as an undergraduate. Were you able to take courses with uh, Professor Speck? Uh, not as an undergraduate, but uh, when I then went on into graduate school, uh, sure. But I met him uh, right from the beginning. He, as you probably know, had a, a kind of uh, eyrie up at the top of, on the fourth floor of College Hall, a long, dark uh, office paneled with books and Indian artifacts. And he'd sit there and kind of hold court for all the students who were interested in American Indians. Um, so I got invited up there from time to time and uh, listened to Speck and watch him. He smoked between the act cigars. And, was neglectful of the ash, so the front of his shirt would be constantly bedecked with ash from the uh, from the cigars. Um, let's see. Uh, what, when you said that he held court, what do you mean by he held court? The student would come and he uh, the students would come and kind of sit at his feet and listen to him tell stories about his his field work and complain about the university and about the stuffiness of the atmosphere. Uh, he was kind of a rebel uh, and uh, uh, with no respecter of authority or bureaucracy at all. But um, he must have been very effective, really, in, a, in a, an unexpected way, because uh, toward the end of his years here, he was able to extract from the administration a promise to uh, bring in a whole new cadre of faculty whom uh, I met uh, as a graduate student, and I'm sure you'll, you already know something about. Um, there were other people that I remember from undergraduate uh, days. I remember being influenced by a course with uh, C. West Churchman, who was in the philosophy of science, uh, and who was working uh, at the time, part-time, at Frankfurt Arsenal, doing the mathematical work on the ballistics. Um, and Churchman gave a course in statistical inference, which uh, I was very important to me because it, it uh, drew my attention to a way of thinking that I had not really been exposed to in, in history courses and the kind of liberal arts that I had had up to that time. And that directed me to 
statistics, uh, simple descriptive statistics, which I later found very useful in, in research. Um, so I had a mixture of uh, experiences, both in the history department itself, where I did take my degree, and also the initial um, coursework, uh, not so much with SPEC, but with Theodore Stern and Ted Carpenter, who, like me, were, were veterans and who were graduate students now and teaching as instructors. Uh, almost all of the students that I knew, both as an undergraduate and as a graduate student, were, were veterans who had uh, served in World War II and uh, now were at college on the GI Bill, um, which <clears throat> really wasn't enough to support you, but did pay tuition, a uh, small amount for books and supplies, uh, a small stipend. Uh, usually eked out by the student's wife who would be able to get a job somewhere around Philadelphia and, and pay the rest of the bills. How do you feel, was the, was, do you feel that there were too many students? Because that was after the war, a lot of uh, the campus was inundated by GIs. The, you feel a lot of too many students? Classes class? were the classes were large. Mm -hmm. I think the, um, by and large, the, the um, the GI students were a rather serious bunch. Uh, they, they realized that now the war was over and they had a new life to uh, lead and uh, it was necessary to get through as fast as possible so that they could start earning a living. And uh, uh, usually without support, traditional support from family in this generation anyway. And that certainly was the way I felt, that uh, I had to get through as fast as I could so that I could support myself. So if they were so serious, everybody <coughs> trying to, to finish schooling as soon as possible, how was social life then among the undergraduates? Well, I, don't, I can't really speak to that. I, I was married. I lived in an apartment off campus. Uh, I had a child. Uh, so uh, what I did was walk across the Walnut Street Bridge and go to class and, uh, and chat with colleagues and uh, our fellow students. Uh, and then. Uh, walk back across the Walnut Street Bridge to um, to the apartment again. So I didn't, uh, I can't say much about social life at all. Do you, do you always wanted to become a teacher? Well, really, I always wanted to become a writer. Uh, my father was a teacher, but he explained to me early on that, that writing was a good sale but a poor raft, and that you uh, you might get moved along by the writing but you needed really, in most cases, to support yourself for subsistence anyway with something else. And teaching in a favorite field was probably the best way. So he, he taught as a professor of English and uh, it seemed a, a natural and easy way to go, especially if in a field like anthropology, where they're really, apart from museum jobs, at least at that time, there were no other job possibilities as an anthropologist except teaching anthropology. Later on, there came to be various applied anthropology specialties, but uh, in 1944, 45, 46, uh, 47, on into the 50s, really, there wouldn't be anything else. Was it then easy for you to get to be uh, to become a faculty member in here? No. <laughs> so tell me no. There, uh, when I got my PhD in 1950, there were, I was told, two job openings new positions in anthropology in the United States. I tried out for both of them, and I didn't get either one. Uh, but uh, I was able to get a job as an instructor in the um, sociology department here, uh, which is a, a close enough field. And I'd taken some coursework in sociology. Uh, and uh, later on, I was able to uh, move into the anthropology department here at, at Penn. So I've really spent my entire academic life here at Penn. Where was the anthropology department? Well, originally the anthropology department was Frank Speck's office. Uh, at, when I came at the end of the war, uh, the, most of the other uh, anthropology faculty and allied faculty uh, from the museum uh, were off on various missions. Heinz Wieschoff had taken a position with the UN uh, in Africa, and he was killed uh, in an airplane accident before he came back. A man named Davidson uh, had gone off to do field work in Australia. Uh, so basically, the people that I knew were uh, Speck, uh, Carpenter, Stern, um, 
Lyndon Satterthwaite, I think, was still here at the museum, a Maya specialist. Uh, and that was about it. Uh, until after the, <clears throat> the new people arrived about 1947-48. Uh, what was the relationship between the anthropology department and the museum at that time? I would say cool. Uh, the, two, uh, the two fields obviously shared a great deal of, uh, in the way of interests, but th at that time the, uh, there was a different institutional arrangement from the one that worked out during the period when I was chairman in anthropology. Uh, the, um, at that time, a curatorship did not necessarily entail a professorship. Uh, and uh, the University Museum had its own quite separate budget system, uh, its own way of raising money for field trips. Uh, its ties with cultural and social anthropology were uncertain. Um, and so th there had been a, I gather, a, a considerable distance between people who should really have been allies and who later did become allies. A, a lot of that changed as soon as uh, uh, Fro Rainey arrived, about 1948 perhaps, as the new director of the University Museum. And he, he had um, um, been a respected social anthropologist as well as an archaeologist. He came to us from Alaska. But he'd done field work in Puerto Rico, and he understood the um, the values of uh, a traditional academic department, not just uh, the the interests uh, needs of a museum. So it was possible with uh, Rainey uh, to think much more about a union of of the two um, administrative sections, uh, if you will, of of anthropology. It involved more than anthropology because the University Museum uh, covered fields like um, Egyptology and Assyriology and so forth and so on that were traditionally outside the purview of anthropology. So a rapprochement between the museum and anthropology really entailed a rapprochement between the museum and the rest of the university. And that required the cooperation of more than just the anthropology department. What sort of a man was the anthropology yeah. department? Uh, visited Tikal and um, did field work uh, and fact, historical work. Yes. As a matter of fact, I went to be co I went to interview him, Ruben Reina. Yes. Yes, I went to call him. In. Oh yeah, he, he's. Uh, Even he though he's not doesn't qualify for. Uh, uh, what does, what, this is. He's a few years younger, I think. Yes, that's what I thought. But this is nice, some of the... Uh, yeah. There's a huge mural-sized reproduction of this that somewhere or other I remember seeing. Um, um, if, you're, if you're looking de for decorations, I would make a marvelous... <laughs> I think yeah, so. Marvelous. The backdrop. <coughs> you let me know. <clears throat> so we were talking about Rainey and he, how was, he was able to incorporate the, the uh, MERS, the, the anthropology department, and the University of Museum with the rest of the university. What type of a man was Rainey? Do you know him? Well, I knew him uh, to work with him uh, on things of this kind, and I always found him to be an, you know, a, a very easy man to, uh, to work with. Could you hold on a second? He was... We would we'll start edit. We would edit. Yes. And if you begin the sentence, he, 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 it's yes. difficult for us to... to Okay, I've got you. Yeah. <coughs> Can you tell me uh, what, what sort of a man was uh, Professor Rainey, Dr. Rainey? Frolic Rainey was a, a, a man who uh, could, uh, I think, work equally well in the field with Eskimos, with administrators on campus, and with fellow colleagues. I, I, I think he was um, a, a perfect choice at the time for the directorship of the University Museum. And at the same time, uh, the um, provost was David Goddard, who uh, I think remained as provost for most of the time when I was uh, uh, chairman. Uh, he had, uh, his family was, had been connected with anthropology uh, for many years, and so he had a sympathetic attitude towards both anthropology and the interests of the museum. So essentially, uh, Goddard and 
uh, Randy and, uh, and myself and the chair, chairman of other departments worked out a, a deal, I suppose you could say, by which the budget, the, the faculty budget of the University Museum uh, became part of the budget of the College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, each and every curator in the museum uh, became a faculty member in an academic department, which w was a major uh, step because it meant that all museum appointments had to go through college personnel appointment procedures, and that had not been the case before. Um, the, uh, all of the faculty members in anthropology and probably in the other participating departments uh, became at, at least honorary curators of something or other in the University Museum, and many of them were active in, in uh, their several departments. Uh, so it, it brought to the museum uh, a secure financial backing from the university, a real commitment from the university to support the museum, uh, and at the same time gave all the benefits of, uh, uh, of faculty standing to the various curators. It meant a change in the way in which the director of a museum could operate. He could no longer discard curators when a particular archaeological program had come to an end. And this, uh, this bothered Rennie a little bit, that uh, he would, would lose a certain freedom of action. But uh, nevertheless, he, he was very cooperative. And I, I hope that this has proven to be a, as good a, an arrangement for the museum as it certainly was for the anthropology department. Then, as you know, the anthropology department moved into the museum, uh, into the new wing. And, uh, and that has brought us, of course, closer and closer together. When, when that happened, do you recall? <clears throat> well, we moved about 1972. The, the history of that um, is a, partly a personal one. Um, about 1962, I got an, um, an offer from Harvard. Uh, so I went to Harvard and was wined and dined and shown around and very much attracted to the, the possibilities there um, and came back and wanted to know what the university would do for me. and. Um, uh, talked with Harnwell, the president, Gaylord Harnwell, the president at the time, and he said, well, what do you want? So I thought, well, this is my chance to lay it on the line. We were then uh, in very cramped quarters in a small uh, end wing of the University Museum, and so I said, well, apart from things like salary and so forth, I want a whole new set of quarters in the University Museum built, uh, in effect, a new wing. And since that idea had been around for a while, uh, Arnold said, well, OK, we'll see what we can do about that. So um, it took a while, but uh, everybody raised money. Uh, Rainey raised a lot of money. Uh, I raised myself a uh, million dollars from National Science Foundation, which was my, the largest grant I ever got. And uh, we put together a package that built the, the new wing on the University Museum with quarters for anthropology, laboratories, um, and space for a number of other academic uh, and curatorial uh, uh, departments. So that all eventually came to pass about 1972. And I think we've been, we've been very fortunate. You said that there were some laboratories put there. What type of laboratories? Why laboratories? Well, there were laboratories for physical anthropology, um, for, for um, um, <clears throat> biochemical kinds of studies that uh, one of my colleagues, Saul Katz, was interested in, a physical anthropologist. Uh, the laboratories are necessary also for the, uh, uh, the treatment of of bones and uh, artifacts that are collected in archaeological investigations for cleaning and for analysis. Um, so uh, what, what we did in the course of planning for the new wing is, is consult the various people who would be using this space and simply ask them, what do you need? And uh, they would say, well, what I would like to have is so many square feet for this or uh, so much counter space, so much storage space, and we then designed the uh, the building around uh, the, the needs of the the faculty and the curators. 
And while well, we didn't get everything that we asked for, we got a large, most of it. When you approach, you said you approach uh, President Harnwick. Yes. What type of a man was President Harnwick? Well, I didn't really know him. Uh, uh, I suppose I've met him on a few occasions in, in meetings and so on. He seemed like a, a friendly, bearish sort of person, a person with an academic background, of course, from physics, if I remember rightly. Um, and interested in the in the expansion and development and improvement of the university. When shortly after I um, got my PhD and then went into the sociology department, the university, I, th I believe it was then, with Harnwell in charge, undertook the first of what I think have been two or th three or four perhaps by now, self-studies, self-evaluations. And um, I remember I was on one of the teams that went around interviewing one of the uh, in parts of the camp of the institution. Um, but this led to applications for funds for the improvement of various departments and facilities on campus in the beginning, I think, really, of uh, a very substantial buildup uh, across the campus in, in various fields, uh, starting starting certainly in the probably the early 1950s. Uh, and by that time, as, as I think we said earlier, the anthropology department itself had uh, benefited from uh, a real expansion with the addition of um, Froelich Rainey, of course, uh, A.I. Hallowell, um, Lauren Isley, uh, Carlton Kuhn, uh, Wilton Krogman, uh, Ward Goodenough, and two or three other people who all came in within the space of, of three or four years at the time when anthropology was expanding really nationally uh, in response in part to a kind of, I think, a, f a federal awareness of the need for the development of expertise within the United States uh, in, in dealing with worldwide American military and diplomatic commitments. Uh, so uh, a lot of money was being put into the development of not only anthropology, but linguistics and various other fields that would uh, help the, uh, the State Department uh, or administrative uh, agencies uh, on Pacific Islands, various other sorts of places. And um, probably comparable kinds of investments were being made on a, the basis of national policy. In, in other fields, for instance, in mental health, in which uh, at one point uh, I was told that uh, one sixth of the anthropologists in the United States were being supported by the uh, uh, by federal mental health funds. Uh, I worked for a number of years at a place called the Eastern Pennsylvania Psychiatric Institute, uh, which was supported both by state and state funds and various grants. Uh, including uh, grants from National Institutes of Mental Health. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, anyway, there, were, there was a, a vast investment in, in, among other things, anthropology and I think universities in general, uh, from which this university benefited greatly. Um, I'm, on this peop on the, I'm on the people who came. You mentioned Lori, Lori Isley. Um, yes, yes. Do you know, could you talk to us about Lauren Isley? Well, I, I knew him as a first, of course, as a graduate student. And um, I, I, I stood in awe of Isley's abilities as a lecturer. He was probably the best, one of the two best lecturers and seminar leaders that I think I've ever uh, had the pleasure of, of working with as a student. Um, he had a phenomenal ability to uh, walk into a class with no preparation and give a perfectly organized one-hour dissertation on some technical complex subject, bringing in recent literature. These weren't canned lectures that he'd practiced <laughs> over the years. He could uh, bring to bear recent literature and recent uh, reports of, of, of finds in paleontology. R really very remarkable. This was before he became um, a uh, a writer for a popular uh, lay audience, uh, although he was certainly beginning to work on his um, 
uh, on the books that made him famous uh, in a much wider field. Um, he, he was chairman of the anthropology department <clears throat> for a number of years. Then he became provost for a year, uh, which I gather wasn't as, wasn't as, wasn't his happiest time. And uh, then he came back uh, to the department as one of the first of the Benjamin Franklin professors and continued his writing. Um, um, again, much of it, not all of it, much of it for a popular audience and some of it continuing to be technical work in the history of science pr particularly, which he specialized in in his last, last academic years. Um, when he, you, you remained here and you became eventually the, anthro the chairman of the anthropology department. Yes. Mm -hmm. How did, how did, how, uh, how, how did you become the chairman of the, of the anthropology department? That was something that you wanted or something that you were selected? Or? It was something that I didn't really expect. What, <clears throat> what really happened, I was at uh, Eastern Pennsylvania Psychiatric Institute, as I said, and I came to be, to my surprise, the director of clinical research there. Uh, in capacity, I was responsible for putting in effect uh, some regulations governing research with mental patients. And this was at a time when the Nuremberg war crimes trials were either still going on or had just recently ended. And among the people convicted there were German doctors who had experimented with uh, patients in uh, concentration camps. Uh, growing out of that uh, legal issue uh, came the articulation of principles uh, for the uh, safeguarding of the human rights of, uh, of mental patients who had lost their civil rights and other medical pa patients as well. Um, this meant, in some cases, regulations coming from National Institute of Mental Health and uh, regulations promulgated in the state of Pennsylvania, particularly at EPPI, that interfered with what was felt to be the freedom of research. You couldn't do this without or that without informing the patient of what you were going to do, without informing the patient of the possible risks to him. Uh, you couldn't. Uh, uh, reveal certain kinds of information in, in future publications and, and so on. So in the course of doing this as, um, as director of clinical research, I began to get an, an enormous amount of flack from the, uh, uh, the research scientists in the clinical field at EPI, and I'd, I came to the point where I felt, who needs this, and I went to, over to Penn talked to Isley and said, uh, in effect, get me out of here and see if you can find me a, a job at the University of Pennsylvania. He was then provost, and uh, I um, found that I did have uh, a position after that at, um, in the anthropology department. The, um, <clears throat> let's see, at the time, uh, Ward Goodenough, I think, had been, the act, when I came in, was the acting chair uh, he then uh, went on a sabbatical to spend a year at Cornell, if I remember. You just talked with him, and you can verify these things. Uh, and while he was at Cornell, I was then approached by the, uh, by the new provost, Goddard, who wanted to have some kind of program developed, uh, a five-year plan, let's say, for the anthropology department. Uh, and um, so I made up what I could uh, in the way of a five-year plan, consulting with people in the various specialties. And um, that included, of course, bringing Ward Goodenough uh, back. And in effect, uh, Goddard said, well, okay, you can have this if you'll accept the chairmanship. So, uh, so then I became chairman and stayed uh, with it, and well, it was 10 years anyway, from about 1961 or 62. How did you rate your experience as a German? I liked it. I, I, yes, I enjoyed the, uh, 
Uh, I didn't like it all the time, uh, but um, I think uh, the experience of being a, a minor bureaucrat is an enlightening one, uh, and uh, it, it ha it's interesting it, just as a, as a problem-solving kind of activity. Uh, one is confronted with all sorts of complex problems that involve technical questions and questions involving human values and uh, people's lives and careers, and, uh, and it's just interesting to try to work things out. What about hmm. funding? Were you, uh, do you have the support of the administration? I was blessed. I think I, I was chairman at the ideal time in the history of anthropology, really, in this country. Uh, it was the time when large infusions of federal money were coming into all institutions, and they applied to anthropology as well. Uh, furthermore, the university had made, it, made a commitment to carry out uh, at least a large part of this development plan that, <clears throat> that I had worked out with, with our faculty and with uh, David Goddard as provost. Uh, so we look forward to a continually expanding department and, and uh, hopefully an expanding uh, um, set of facilities when uh, the university came through with the promised new uh, quarters that uh, the, the president had, had uh, said would be forthcoming. Tell me, why uh, you had a, a different approach. What different approach did you, did you bring into the field of anthropology, incorporating psychology? Uh, well, the, uh, I, I certainly wasn't the first uh, person to do this. Uh, when I became a graduate student, <clears throat> I particularly studied with um, A.I. Hallowell, and he was already well known for co trying to combine studies uh, of traditional ethnographic, uh, a traditional ethnographic kind with the use of the Rorschach technique, which is a pr projective test that he had uh, adapted for use with um, Ojibwe Indians. And so, uh, I was fascinated by that, and also, uh, I must confess, by the fact that he had an interest in um, the history of the peoples that he was uh, working with. Uh, and my, uh, as I explained, my undergraduate work uh, was in history, and I had already done quite a lot of uh, work on the Indians of colonial Pennsylvania. In fact, I published a book with the University of Pennsylvania Press in 1949 before I got my PhD on uh, um, a colonial Indian noteworthy. So the combination of psychology and history in Hallowell's uh, um, handling of, of anthropology fit, fit, fitted my interests precisely. And I've really combined, I think, both throughout my career, perhaps alternating, uh, but uh, keeping both in mind. At EPI, EPPI, Eastern Pennsylvania Psychiatric Institute, um, the work was primarily psychological, uh, but in recent years I've done um, mostly hi culture, historical kinds of studies, community studies of a small community called Rockdale in southeastern Pennsylvania and a, a coal mining town, St. Clair, in Schuylkill County. So. Um, but you you originally asked about the psychology and culture and <clears throat> and um, yeah I that's the the subject the field within which I did my PhD uh, and I published a number of things that would fall into that uh, category since but there are a lot of people at that time who were working in personality and culture the pioneers might be uh, uh, David Sapir. Margaret Mead, Ruth Benedict, a whole tradition that grew from, uh, from uh, essentially from Boaz and his school at Columbia, um, uh, with infusions from clinical psychology and psychoanalysis, uh, and the field of projective tests. The, uh, this whole field, I think, is less prominent as a specialty now, as a self-conscious specialty, but much of it has simply been incorporated into 
uh, general ideas in cultural anthropology. Much of it has been uh, simply absorbed into the symbols and meanings school of, uh, of cultural anthropology. So it, <clears throat> it, it nourished changes within the whole field and uh, wasn't merely a, a kind of a side specialty. Now, how do you see the anthropology department uh, today? Does it still have the same sort of support than when you were chairman? Well, I can't speak to anything really administrative. Uh, those folks have their own problems now, and I'm not going to worry about, about them. But I, the department essentially, I believe, is going along in much the same direction as it did before. Excuse me. <clears throat> it, it has traditionally attempted to, to keep together a holistic view of anthropology, uh, combining ethnography, the description of, of behavior, uh, of traditional behavior, and uh, archaeology, uh, the digging up the artifacts uh, that tell us about the past, and physical anthropology, which uh, deals with human evolution and especially today, which is a, a very hot topic, um, and various fields in what might be called applied human biology, and uh, linguistic anthropology. Uh, we, in the past, had on our staff uh, Del Himes, a distinguished uh, linguist and anthropologist, and, and a couple of other people. Uh, we lost them. Word Good Enough has been attempting to, with help from the linguistics department, to keep this part of the program alive. And, and I'm hopeful that new appointments will bring in uh, specialists in linguistic anthropology within the department itself. Uh, so that, that combination has been characteristic of Penn's anthropology department. Not true in some other institutions who uh, think that that's a muddy kind of mixture and would um, really rather see social and cultural anthropology go along on their own as, so, as social sciences and let human biology be taken care of by people in, in other fields. Dr. Goodwin out. Uh, he's about to retire. I believe so. Um, do you, when you came uh, at Penn, do you find that the faculty members from other departments, I'm talking sociology, most likely you would think that sociology department will be very much close to the anthropology department, the history department. Do you see that as a cohesive group? No, not at all. I think traditionally, it, in spite of the fact that there are have been always a lot of efforts to maintain ties between fields that an outsider would think ought to be close together, uh, for various reasons, uh, there has tended to be a, a, a great deal of um, disciplinary parochialism, I suppose you'd say, uh, with potentially allied fields just going off on their own and with minimal sharing of, uh, of uh, programs and courses. I, I mean, there's, there, this is not an absolute, an absolute thing. Uh, and I've been involved in a number of efforts that go, went in the opposite direction. Um, in the early 50s, the uh, university received a grant from the Ford Foundation to develop a, a, an interdisciplinary program in the social sciences uh, and set up something called the Behavioral Research Council uh, that brought together people from history, uh, Roy Nichols, for instance, uh, Dorothy Thomas from sociology, um, uh, Tom Cochran from, from history, myself, uh, from anthropology and people from political science and economics and so on. Uh, that, that survived as long as the money lasted, but then it ended when, when the grant ran out. Um, more recently, there's been a successful program in ethno-history combining anthropology, uh, the history department, 
um, and to some extent American civilization and other other fields, and that's uh, that too has been quite successful. So it's, but the efforts have rarely been, I think, in involving the. Um, a real administrative consolidation. They're sort of voluntary, voluntary activities engaged in by uh, various faculty members who are allowed by their departments to do this rather than making it a departmental um, commitment. But do you see the reason for it? That is a problem of uh, funding, perhaps, or a problem of not? I don't know. I mean, it, it, Thinking of the uh, sociology and anthropology case, um, at one point w w the anthropology offices were in Bennett Hall, and uh, the, qu the department was asked whether it would like to have uh, larger offices in Dietrich Hall uh, affiliated with the sociology department or in the university museum, uh, and uh, the anthropology faculty wanted to be in the University Museum, which is where we went. Well, that made it put us about a mile apart, and uh, it, it just on the basis of physical distance, it would be inconvenient, it would be difficult to, to establish informal uh, communion with, with the sociology department under those circumstances. So I think in that case, physical distance made some, some difference. It's also several departments at one time also was under the Wharton School. That's correct. It was when Sociology I. Sociology and economics. I was there. And, and political science. Were you here when that? Yes. If you were here, did you see? Did you hear? When I was, was in, accepted? I I was when I was a, an instructor in sociology. Um, those five academic fields were part of the uh, the Wharton School, and it was a number of years later that they that they moved out. I mean it. Uh, that in itself has an interesting history. The, um, the Wharton School was probably the first and only business school in the country that required its students to study not merely business subjects, but also uh, uh, the social sciences, something about the society in which their business activity would go on. Uh, so from that standpoint, it was an, an enlightened thing for a business school to do. Um, but in a sense, they preempted the field, having done that, and it would be uneconomical to set up a parallel set of, of departments in the college, where, which would have been the logical alternative place. So that, just as a historical accident, I think, um, made uh, rapprochement a little more difficult. Among the, among the faculty members in the sociology department, do you happen to no closely Digby Balsell? Not, not closely. I think Digby was a graduate student about the same time that I was, but he was in sociology and I was in, in anthropology. Uh, but I remember him from, from back then, yes. And um, he was one of the few graduate students, I suppose, in sociology that, uh, that for one reason or another I came in contact with. Um, but later I came to know Dorothy Thomas perhaps uh, better than any of the others because she was in the um, um, very active in the, the Behavioral Research Council and, and very anxious to see uh, empirical kinds of social researchers get together. She, uh, she had great contempt for sociological theory of any kind. Uh, what she liked was was to, to go into the field and collect data, and she respected anthropologists because they went into the field and they collected data and took photographs and counted things. So we we looked like empiricists to to her. Do you feel that the methods uh, of uh, teaching or their approach has practically changed and become more quantitative? when you were a student and when they are now, uh, as these people well, now? Well, I think, yes, I don't think that's true in, in cultural anthropology. I think it's almost gone in the other direction, um, as opposed to sociology, which I suspect is more quantitative. Uh, in cultural anthropology, I think the, the emphasis, well, when I was a graduate student, when Goodenough was a student of 
George Peter Murdoch, and he probably mentioned Murdoch when you interviewed him. The uh, there was a an intense interest in statistical cross-cultural studies, uh, drawing correlations between um, such things as the uh, the prevalence of witchcraft and the amount of authority in a society. Uh, but uh, that f whole uh, tradition has, I think, dwindled considerably because most of the correlations are so loose that one can't really think of them easily as, as laws. You still have to study the individual case to know what's going on. Um, but what has come on strongly since, I mentioned earlier, is a kind of uh, tradition in, uh, in interpretive anthropology, whether you call it symbols and meanings or uh, the interpretation, the, the fine-tuned interpretation of uh, linguistic texts or ritual behavior or, uh, or law or, or what have you, an effort to, to uh, understand meanings. And this is, more, this is more like a geometry than a statistics. And I think that has made, to some extent, cultural anthropology less quantitative rather than more. Well, being less quantitative is not also assume that it's more less like the, the, theor the theoretical value of it a little bit. Well, of course, <clears throat> my, um, I tend to look somewhat askance at uh, some of the work in, in the symbols and meaning tradition because they, those people don't count things. Uh, they rely on, in a sense, on intuition and authority. A, a kind of statement uh, to the effect that I was there, I know these people in this place, and I've studied these texts very closely, and this is what they mean. And uh, and a graduate student can't disprove <laughs> uh, that the, such a proposition. Uh, so it becomes pretty much a contest between uh, uh, between authorities and um, and I. I think that's a, you know, in a way, I feel that that's not the way in which a science should go. A, one should generate testable propositions of a general kind, and so I, I have a, a lot of sympathy for the, the Murdoch kind of tradition where the effort is to, to make, to, to state propositions, however derived, that have general application and then devise uh, techniques for testing these, hopefully quantitatively, uh, so that a, a proposition can be disproved. If you can't disprove what you said, if there's no procedure for disproving it, it's just not a science. Do you feel uh, yeah, that the anthropology department uh, today at the University of Pennsylvania, it is very well known? compared to other schools? Oh, yes. I, uh, from the 1960s on, we have ranked, and at least our graduate program has ranked, usually number three in the country. Uh, Chicago and Berkeley, I think, usually outdo us. Chicago and Berkeley have something like three times as many faculty members as we do. I mean, we're run really one of the smaller departments now among the, the major departments, but we have um, consistently maintained a very high ranking in, in nationally and and I'm sure internationally as well. Um, I'd say it, 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 I would assume now uh, and certainly until recently it's been one of the, the top five departments in the country. Do you feel that there is still a sort of very strong interest among the, among the students to come into the field of anthropology? Yes, but I think the, the um, the emphasis is has been shifting somewhat. The uh, the program in in cultural anthropology and ethnography now draws, I believe, proportionately fewer new graduate students and and undergraduates to the classes courses. And uh, archaeology and physical anthropology tend to uh, bring in bring in more. So there's been something of a shift. Shortly after World War II, the interest really was in, in um, 
the techniques of ethnography, cultural anthropology, uh, understanding the behavior of alien populations with whom Americans were for the first time coming into close commercial diplomatic contact. And uh, the hope for vast enlightenment from this perhaps has dwindled, uh, or perhaps it's simply uh, uh, that anthropologists haven't been able to give the guidance that, uh, that uh, originally was hoped for. And so I think there's less confidence in anthropology's ability to write prescriptions for how to get along with the Ayatollah, uh, which would be the, the, su <laughs> the supreme test. So, Kina, but could you, could you, could you want to say that? Sure. Pause. How much yes, the religion aspect influencing the uh, people, how the people behave and all that? Uh, yes. Yeah, so you mentioned Ayatollah, <coughs> the, the Muslim, and all the thing that is going on in today's world is the center, the focus of religion, really, fanatism. Well, let me back up a little bit. And um, when I was at the Behavioral Research Council in the 19, early 1950s, uh, I w was interested in um, studying a, an Iroquois Indian religious prophet named Handsome Lake, whom I had become aware of in the course of even earlier work with the, the history of American Indians. And uh, I got a grant, a National Institute of Mental Health grant, to study uh, the life and times of Handsome Lake as a, an exemplar of uh, <coughs> Uh, religious enthusiasm in a religious movement. Uh, and in the course of doing that, I became interested in, I began to realize that Handsome Lake represented a, a very large class of persons and events, uh, which I called revitalization movements, uh, in, in which a prophet, usually a religious prophet, uh, becomes aware of the, the social economic military catastrophe that is occurring in his society and uh, typically at some point has a, a visionary experience, a hallucinatory experience if you will, in which a deity speaks to him and diagnoses the problem of the society and his own problem, personal problem, and tells him what to do about it. And as a result of this experience, the prophet uh, f formulates, articulates a, what I call a code and he spells out what's wrong with the world as it is. Uh, he describes what the utopia should be like, and he d most importantly, he describes a mechanism for getting from where we are now to where we ought to be, a transfer culture. Um, so I <clears throat> was interested not just in Handsome Lake, but also in the, uh, in the larger phenomenon of revitalization movements, which s seem to characterize a lot of religious events and the, and the origin of a great many religions. Uh, so I wrote a paper which um, has been reproduced a lot entitled Revitalization Movements, uh, originally published in the American Anthropologist, and a number of years later did a book on the life and times of Handsome Lake, uh, entitled The Death and Rebirth of the Seneca. Uh, Okay, moving on to more recent times, I would have to say that the Ayatollah and the recent revolution in Iran are a classic example of a revitalization movement. Whether we think much of the, the uh, values that are expressed by, by the prophet is, is beside the point. That for many people in Iran, obviously, uh, he, was, um, he was speaking God's word uh, and describing what he regarded and others regarded as a disastrous state of affairs in which Iran was being westernized and dominated by Western powers. Uh, he, he led a revolutionary movement and has been busy in trying to reestablish what he regards as a, a true Islamic society. And I mean, this is a classic example. But uh, having, having said that, that doesn't uh, enable one immediately to to understand how, what American policy should be toward it. Um, 
just because it has these characteristics doesn't necessarily mean that uh, one has to go along with it. But I, it seems to me important to understand what is happening and uh, the, the power of the feelings of uh, the leader and his followers and the, and the genuineness. What se seems so often to happen is that our people who are trying to articulate national policy Initial for a year or two, don't take it seriously. They think that that the prophet is is mad, and that the his policies are insane, and that nobody really is going to follow this very long. And they underestimate by orders of magnitude the commitment of a at least a, se a major segment of a of a population to what we can't believe is a uh, a, a serious program. Well, I think. This perhaps is the, the important thing about the, the concept of, of something like revitalization movements, that uh, it, it, it may seem strange and regressive, but one cannot assume that it is not seriously taken very, very seriously by the people who are participate, participating in it. And one cannot assume that they won't die for it.